Well, praise the Lord. Tonight, I want to encourage your heart with a word the Lord said to speak on prayer. Luke chapter 11. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11 because your faith is no more effective than your ability to pray prayers God will hear. Too often, we're still praying just words, too many of us at least. And so we're coming right back to learn how to pray. And it came to pass, Luke 11, verse 1, that as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, which means we must have to learn how. As John also taught his disciples, both Jesus and John thought it necessary to teach how to pray. And he said unto them, when you pray, now that's my subject tonight, when you pray. You know, by the way, that he taught here the so-called model prayer. We don't have to read that. We all know it from Sunday school. Our Father, which art in heaven. And skip down to verse 9. And he says, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. He's talking still about prayer. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. That is the promise of Jesus. If you ask, it will be given. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, it will be open. Why is it Then the churches of our day encourage people to believe that God sometimes, occasionally, may answer prayer if it's his will? All I'm telling you is what he said. He didn't qualify it. You qualify it in your thinking. For verse 10 continues, everyone that asketh receiveth. Are you an everyone? Or is your little wheels going around in your head and all of that old dead theology surfacing that says, well, now I know he said it, but. And so Christians go around sounding like a motorboat or a billy goat, but, but, but. <laughs> but everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh find it, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. When you pray. When you pray, take the limits off your prayers. Just like Jesus does. He said, everyone that asketh receive it. He said, all things you ask whatsoever in prayer believing you shall receive. So take the limits off. When you pray, count God faithful. If God's God, then he has to be faithful. And he says he is all through his word. He said, if I've said it, I'll do it. Hold fast to your confession of faith. I am faithful who made you the promise. And refuse to think the negative when you pray. Confess the positive. That's what God's word is. It's positive. He doesn't think the negative. He never confesses the negative. You know, there's nothing more discouraging than to learn, as a number of us have after becoming Christians, that the church of our day not only doesn't know how to pray the prayer of faith, most Christians don't even expect God to answer when they pray. Because they've been taught to condition their prayers with that little word, if, which means I fail. If to a prayer is a confession you don't believe you're going to get an answer anyway. And if anyone comes along and teaches, you know, that, well, you should never condition prayer with if. That is concerning the promises of God. There isn't a word in the Bible that God ever says to put an if on a promise when you pray. Then that person is charged with being presumptuous. In spite of the fact that Jesus said, everyone that asketh receiveth, if you seek you'll find. He says, if you knock it shall be opened unto you. That's what he said. So nothing is more discouraging, disheartening, frustrating than to stand at the door of knock and have the religious leaders say to you, well, now you really shouldn't expect God to answer that knock. Unless you know it's an emergency and if it's his will and you happen to catch God on a day when he's meeting needs and answering prayers. And if you beg and plead long enough, you stand there in line long enough and you knock loud enough, maybe if it doesn't rain and you're lucky, he'll pick you out of the crowd and answer one of your petitions. That just flies in the face of all that Jesus teaches. Cuts cross grain to all that he says here in Luke chapter 11. And so the religious leaders of our day not only have cut themselves off from their inheritance because of a lack of faith, but they've thrown away the key so that you can't enter into your inheritance because they've not taught you how to pray the prayer of faith. They've not even taught you to believe that God can be taken at his word. That he wrote all of this for a purpose. 
And it surprises people to find out God will really do what he says and that he expects us to obey him when he says in Matthew 5, turn the other cheek and take no oath and all of those things that we taught you in the Sermon on the Mount. I just received a letter recently where the woman said that we were teaching to a circle of ladies the Sermon on the Mount. It's on tape. And she said, when I started to introduce the session, before we listened to the tape, saying, now, God expects us to obey Matthew 5, 6, and 7, she said, it looked like that I'd slapped them in the face. That Christians today would even think that God expects them to do what he says comes as a surprise to them. It comes to surprise some of you out there to really hear me say, and some of you are hearing it for the first time, that when... God says when you knock, he will open. It does not matter to me what men say. This is what God says. I don't care what men teach. Jesus said all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing there's a condition you shall receive. It doesn't matter what man says. He says whatever you ask in my name, I will do. I saw my mother saved on that. Went to Israel on the next one, Mark eleven twenty four. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you have received, and you'll have them. I got a new car on that one too, by the way. He said, whatever you desire. And I've taken him his word, and he has confirmed his word over and over again. This is what Jesus says. But men say, if you pray this way, you're presumptuous. You're telling God how to answer prayer. And it's God saying, I've already told you how I'll answer prayer. When are you going to start believing it? Jesus said, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Men say poverty is a measure of spirituality. <laughs> Jesus said the prayer of faith will heal the sick. He said you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Men say you ought to pray if it be thy will, Lord, heal the sick. <laughs> and so if you get sick, as I've said so often here, the average church will put you on their prayer list and pray for you and pray and pray and pray and pray until you either die or get well in spite of their unbelief. That's the only way you can get off of most prayer lists is either to get well or die. Because they're going to pray for you. And the fact, very fact they keep praying for you to get well, if it's God's will, proves that they don't really believe that if they knock, God will open the door. It proves they don't really believe that the prayer of faith will heal the sick. It proves they really don't believe that all things you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. And so I want to give you those three or four things tonight. When you pray, take the limits off. God already has. Because he said all things whatsoever you ask in prayer believing. Extend your faith, you shall receive. Extend your faith to include all that God's promised without any reservation from the smallest temporal need you've got, like buying a pair of shoes, to the greatest spiritual desire and need of your heart. Take all the limits off. You see, most Christians only believe what they've been taught by churches who don't believe very much. Most Christians believe that God's only concern is getting sinners' souls saved and he's waiting till they die so he can take them to heaven. There's nothing in between. You're going to get it all over there. And Scripture doesn't teach this. Scripture does not teach this. Philippians 4, 6 says to be careful for nothing but in everything, not some things but everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Jesus said, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Now, when he said that, he meant exactly what he said. And he said what he meant. Amen. He's saying it's up to you. All things you ask, believing you shall receive. And the responsibility is right on us. I may have told some of you about this wise man that I read about who always gave the right answer to everything, and that's why he was a wise man, because, well, he had the right answers. And so one young skeptic, said, well, I have a way that I can prove that whatever he says, he'll be wrong, because I have a way in which whether he says yes or no, he'll be wrong. And so he took up a young canary, put it behind him, went to the wise man, he said, is this bird in my hands dead or alive? And if he said it's dead, he'd bring forth a live bird. If he said it's alive, then he'd twist his neck and bring forth a dead bird. So <laughs> he was going to prove he wasn't so wise. And so he did that. And he said to him, now, which is the bird, dead or alive? Well, the wise man didn't even look toward his hands at all, just looked deep in his eyes. He said, son, it's whatever you wish it to be. <laughs> now, th that's just a roundabout way for me to say to you that's what God is trying to say 
to you through all the faith teaching of this church that it's whatever you wish it to be. It's up to you. He said over and over in his word, I sent Jesus to Calvary to provide you with all of this. He's saying from that point on, I'm not going to do a thing. It's up to you. It's whatever you wish it to be. Amen. God wants you to trust him for everything from the smallest temporal need to the greatest spiritual need you have. Well, look at Mary, his mother. Ask him to turn water into wine. Most useless miracle in all the Bible if you measure things in terms of what God thinks is important and what isn't. She thought it was important. Jesus thought it was important enough to answer her. Water into wine to a group of people who've already drunk so much it's gone. So I so often say it's time to bring out the seven-ups. But... <laughs> He didn't think it was useless, and Elisha performed a miracle when one of the sons of the prophets lost his axe head in the Jordan River. They could have gone down to the hardware store and bought one, but Elisha cut him a pole and fished for it, and that axe head, metal, iron, steel axe head, swam and attached itself to his fishing pole. And I believe that. And if you don't believe it, you're going to be miserable coming to this church. <laughs> and... Uh, Running the danger of repeating myself, we believe even the covers are genuine leather. <laughs> That's how much we believe it. And so I had a friend who uh, preached in his church, the biggest church in Lexington, First Baptist Church. He had a Ph.D. degree, and he wasn't ashamed to stand in the pulpit and said, when I go to buy a pair of shoes, I pray about it first, I'd be sure to get two left ones. He wasn't afraid to take those simple things to the Lord. The same faith I pray for cancers for, I pray for a parking place or a bed that you can rest in in a motel or a meal that you don't always have to eat by faith in a restaurant, that you can eat it and won't have to exercise faith that it won't kill you. <laughs> or at least it will be nourishing. George Mueller, once he prayed for a south wind to come up in the middle of the winter because his furnace had gone out until he could fix it. And overnight, God sent a furnace so they could shut it down, a big furnace in an orphanage that he had gotten by faith. And God sent the strong, south, warm wind in, and then he prayed that God would give the workmen a heart to get it done, because in the middle of the winter, you couldn't delay a thing like that. And at five o'clock, when they were ready to quit, they said, we've decided to work all night. And of course, he hadn't told them he had prayed for God to give them a heart to finish the work. Maybe that's not a big thing to you, but God will even change the wind. God is interested in all of your needs. We have friends out on the East Coast that prayed for the dogs to be healed. Dog had distemper, took it to the vet. Somebody gave it to them. They didn't know it had distemper, and right away the veterinarian, he saw what was wrong, and he just about, they said, went through the ceiling, bringing that dog in here. Now we've got to disinfect everything, and all the other dogs would get it if we didn't. They'd get that thing out of here. Well, he said, since you've already got it here, I'll put it to sleep. All they said, no thanks. Uh, if it's that bad, we'll just claim his healing. We believe God will heal him. Well, of course, he was glad to get rid of the dog and them on that. <laughs> We're talking about what's God interested in, your needs. So they said, we took him home, laid hands on him, and he immediately got up and began to eat and was perfectly healed. And six months later, happened to see the vet, told him about it, and he was so impressed. Well, he says, you never cure distemper. He says, you can prevent it, but you can't cure it. Found out the dog was still living. He was so impressed, said he came to one of our charismatic prayer meetings, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You know, it's so hard to convince Christians that God wants to bless them anyway, but just spiritually get their souls saved. Uh, most Christians, most Christians find a real resistance in their heart to the truth that God wants to bless them temporally, physically, as well as spiritually. Most of us have the idea that God would be displeased if we ever got out of debt or were healthy. And you'll search in vain all through the Bible, dear friends, to find one verse. Listen to it. You'll search in vain to find one verse where God encourages his people to be failures in life, are sick all the time, or to owe everyone in town, to be so burdened with debt you have no time for spiritual matters. On the contrary, 3 John 2 is his word. Beloved, I wish above all things. What's above all things? Name me something above all things. <laughs> Well, he said, I wish above all things you prosper and be in health, even as your soul is prospering. 
Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, All of your needs will be supplied. <laughs> Philippians 4, 19, My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Mark 16 and verse 18 says, You can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. James 5 says, The prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Now that's what God says. It doesn't matter what man says. And when you ask God to prosper you, when you ask God to heal you when you're sick, when you ask God to save your loved ones, when you ask God to do something he's promised to do, all you're doing is asking God to fulfill his word to you to do what he wants to do if you're believing for it. You're not going to displease God by asking him to do what he says he wants to do. On the contrary, you'll displease him if you have a need as his child and don't ask. Just like a natural parent and a natural child, a parent would be displeased if a child refused to believe the parent and get help in time of need even though it had been promised. It's so difficult, though, to get Christians to believe that God is interested in anything but their souls, the spiritual aspect. And God doesn't divide man up this way. And this same couple who got their dog healed of distemper, and there's a story about that dog that I can tell you more about that some other time. The dog proved, though, he had more sense than a lot of Christians I know. And that's not being derogatory. It's absolute truth. Well, since... You're looking at me the way you're looking at me, I'll tell you now. <laughs> that every time they prayed in tongues, they would sit and hold hands on their beds. And she said, from the moment we laid hands on that dog and it was healed, he would come in every night as we'd pray in the Spirit and hold hands and put his head under our hands as long as we prayed in tongues. Because he had known that's what had healed him. Oh, he's got a lot more sense than Christians than <laughs> They're saying all of this is the devil and tongues are not for day and all of that. That dog knew. <laughs> well, anyway, this same couple, they were good old Presbyterians. They were until they got disfranchised. He was one of the pillars of the church, but they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they didn't know much about faith or teaching or what God was interested in. And they said, Brother Thing, we had a need for $975, desperately needed that exact amount. Had to have it very soon. We just received the baptism. We didn't know anything about anything. We didn't know anything about demons, faith, healing, or anything else. But she said, we had this desperate need and my, for $975 my husband and I were talking about. It. And we said, well, why don't you ask the Lord for it? Oh, she said, we don't ask God for money. <laughs> you don't ask God for material things. Well, he said, why not? He said, when you had a spiritual need, you ask him, he blessed you. He said, it works the same way for material needs. It's in the Word, friend. And so she said, we went that night to prayer, my husband and I, and with much fear. <laughs> and we desperately need it, so we're going to claim it. And they did use their faith at that point. We claim it in Jesus' name. She said, in two days, it came in the mail from an unsuspecting source, like, you know, the government. <laughs> <laughs> They didn't even know why they were getting $976. They got a dollar more than they'd claim. And they went down to the bank to deposit so they could write their $975 check, and they wouldn't have to close their account out. See, they'd have a dollar in it. But, and told the bank where they got it. Oh, they said, you better send that back. They said, they've made a mistake. Government doesn't send you nearly $1,000 and not tell you what it's for. Well, they said, we claim to be faith. I think we're just going to hold on to it and believe it. We're going to write this check by faith that the government won't claim it back. She said, in about two more days, then the government sent a letter and told us why we were getting, and it was ours. But you know, it's so sad to have to go around to convince Christians God loves them, that he's concerned about all of their needs. He's the one that said, be careful for nothing but in everything with prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God all things you ask in prayer. Whatsoever in prayer believing, you shall receive. Yeah, I'm not going to displease God if I ask him to do for me what he says he wants to do, to heal me when I'm sick, give me a loaf of bread when I'm hungry, save my loved ones, meet my needs, protect and deliver me. He's got thousands of promises in his word. But I will displease him in the matter of healing, for example, if I'm sick, if I'm suffering an attack of the enemy, symptoms and this sort of thing, yeah, I will displease him if he sent Christ to the cross to provide that for me and then I don't apply for it when I need it because I refuse to believe it. That means Jesus Christ suffered and died in vain for me at that point. That's right. Amen. Or for you. 
Because Isaiah 53 verses 3 and 4 says, He did bear away your diseases and he carried away your pains. That's what the Hebrew says. Doesn't matter what the English says. But you can read it in the English in Matthew 8, 16 and 17 because Matthew quotes Isaiah 53 and he said that Jesus took their infirmities and this was to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah concerning it. And so I'm going to displease God if he put all that suffering and pain upon him for me and I won't apply for it when I need it. And so the brother said to me that he didn't know that healing was in the atonement. And I said, you know, that there's so many Christians today who are suffering unnecessarily and they're diseased and they're dying prematurely because they don't know that it's been provided and all they have to do is ask for it. And he said that his wife had suffered many, many heart attacks and she was to the place where the doctor had said to him that if she suffers one more, he said, you're going to walk in and find her on the floor one day. She can't take another one. She said to me, she was listening to it, she said, yes, I sat right there. She showed me the spot in the rug where she'd worn a hole in it. I sat there for six years knitting sweaters. Couldn't do a thing. Helpless. Invalid. Hadn't been out to church or anywhere in six years. An invalid. Got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Discovered healing. You know, it was in the atonement later. But, but this time, they didn't know anything about it. And by the way, she suffered another attack and was in bed. And just, you know, at the point of death and... He said, I was pacing the floor and crying out to God, Lord, why does she have to die? She is a relatively young woman, a good mother. She wants to go to church. Why does she have to die? He said, the Lord spoke to me, Brother Freeman, and said, she doesn't have to die. He said, I would heal her if you would ask me. Turn it around, dear friends, which means he would not heal you or he would not heal her if she didn't ask you. And so he said, well, I rushed into the bedroom and said to my wife, well, I believe God will heal you if we ask him. Well, she said, I do too, let's ask him. And they did, and he did. <laughs> he prayed for her, out of bed she came. They both said, that's all there was to that heart condition. Oh, yes, trials along the way and that sort of thing. But so many refuse to believe the simple word of God that if you ask, you'll receive. Well, it just doesn't fit into what I've been taught. In Bible or no Bible, I don't believe God wants to make me well or to get me out of debt. I believe that that's a mark of my spirituality when I've got Job's boils and Paul's thorns and Lazarus's poverty and all of that. And yes, dear friends, all you are is an old, old, good work, self-righteous individual running around parading your sickness and your poverty and saying, look how humble and spiritual I am. Oh, it couldn't glorify God in a thousand years. I've never seen sick people yet who glorified anybody but themselves. Look how humble I am. I'm wearing my suffering like a crown, they say. Third John 2 is just one of the many, many promises, dear friends, which prove that God wants you to claim your full inheritance. God wants you to walk in victory above sin and self and sickness and Satan and defeat. Take all the limits off God when you pray. Get them out of your mind. He doesn't have them in his. He said all things you ask in prayer, believing you receive. He said everyone that asketh receiveth, that seeketh findeth, that knocketh it shall be open to him. Then over in Hebrews 10, 23, Paul says, let us hold fast to our confession of faith without doubting. Why? For he is faithful that promised. And so I encourage you, well, secondly, when you pray, is to count God faithful to do what he says that he will do. Count God faithful. And when you put an if on your prayers, as most Christians do today, charismatic and otherwise, they do. Let's face it, let's be honest tonight. Let's just say it like it is. When you put an if on a promise of God, it's your confession to heaven, earth, and hell. You're not sure God will keep his word. That's right. You're saying, I'm not sure he's faithful. Amen. When you put an if on a promise, that's what you're saying. If he says the prayer of faith will heal the sick, if he says, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory, if he says all things you ask in prayer believing you shall receive, if he says, I forgive all your iniquities and heal all your diseases, and if he says all of these other things that we've quoted so many times, if he says that, and then you put an if on there when you have that need, then you're saying, I'm not sure I can trust his word. 
surely it must mean something else. And so you start hunting around for a proof text to contradict it. And there it is. Epaphroditus was sick once. So maybe I've got Epaphroditus' sickness. Or over here there was Lazarus laid at the gate full of sores. And I've got both his poverty and his sores. So maybe that I'm going to be taken to be with the Lord pretty soon. I'm not sure. I pray for my healing and the deliverance from my financial needs, but maybe it's not God's will because here are examples where somebody got sick once or where they had a need. Well, praise God. So you found a proof text to talk yourself out of tongues because you found that verse that the church quotes so often today, that tongues is the least gift. Only trouble is I'm still hunting for that one. You may have found it, but I'm still looking for it. Because there isn't a verse in the Bible that says tongues are least gift or any of these other things that so often we're taught. Count God faithful. I find the greatest evidence as I travel about teaching, I find the greatest evidence of lack of faith among Christians is to be seen in the fact they don't really count God faithful. You know what God has shown me about this? You know what God has shown me? That there's essentially no difference between a heathen who believes in a God who doesn't exist and a professing Christian who doesn't believe a God who does exist. I'll repeat that so you won't miss it. God has shown me there's essentially no difference between a heathen who believes in a God who doesn't exist than a professing Christian who doesn't believe the word of a God who does exist. There's no difference in God's sight. Oh, I'm just going to be real real stern and firm with you tonight. I'm going to say it like it is because I find very few Christians who really find it a delight to trust God alone for everything and count Him faithful. Most Christians really, if they were honest, really dislike having to trust God and nothing else. You know, if it's an accident or an emergency or a financial threat of bankruptcy, when they can't trust a doctor or a psychiatrist or the miracle drug or the finance company or insurance company or a lightning rod or the human intellect and wisdom, when they just have to shut themselves up to God, it's a terrifying thought for most Christians. Hello. <laughs> And the reason that you have such fear and anxiety when you're faced with these things and you just shut yourself up to God when you, some of you tried that and you just backed off when you saw it was too fearsome, the reason is because Satan's behind all that fear and anxiety. And he's saying to you, what in the world are you going to do if you've canceled your Blue Cross and hospitalization and you get sick and you end up in the hospital? How are you going to pay your bills? You ever heard that one? I'll tell you the source. I've heard it when I canceled mine. <laughs> And he's saying to you, oh, what are you going to do if it's serious, you know, and you just rely on the prayer of faith alone and the anointing of oil while you may die or you may get so chronic that then the doctors couldn't even cure you. <laughs> Ever heard that one? That's from the same record, same source. Or he says, what are you going to do if you let the deadline pass and that money you prayed for and you said, oh, God will provide it. And look here, the deadline's just 48 hours away. What are you going to do? You just rely on the prayer of faith. You better now have a little uh, scheme over here in reserve in case God doesn't show up with the bunny. Heard that one? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> haven't been praying if you haven't had him tell you that. And he'll say, what are you going to do? You know, no lightning rod on your church steeple or barn if lightning strikes. Or if it's a broken bone or some emergency, a heart attack. And I tell you, dear friends, I say it sadly, but I find so many Christians are willing to side in with the word of the devil at that point instead of the word of God. You just sang it. I heard you sing it. I don't think anybody wasn't singing it. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he'll do it. If he's spoken, that he'll make it good. I heard you singing it, and yet most Christians will side in with the devil. When it's a real test and a trial. Oh, they'll talk about their faith. They'll say, how I believe the word of God. But you watch them make excuses in an emergency. I'm not saying it's easy. The trials, some of them are severe. But you watch them back off. I shared with some people once to prove this point that in time of emergency we'll try anything but God. Because, you know, I mean, after all, God says just turn loose and, <laughs> and trust me. And no seat belts, lightning rods, blue cross, or anything else. Just me. 
For there were these two fellows, uh, Christians, who were boasting about their faith. That is, they were telling one another how God had blessed them, kind of boasting along the way. And one would tell one incident how God had blessed him because he'd exercised faith. And another one would say, well, let me tell you how I use my faith. And they just keep topping one another until the brother who was visiting the other one told such an incident of how God had blessed him. The other one said, well, I can't top that because I believe you've got more faith than I have. He says, I've never had a trial like that and you got through it. So this brother who had all the faith was going home that night, been raining and had to walk along a slippery path and there was a precipice about a hundred feet, you know, sheer drop. And his feet slipped and over the cliff he went head first. Crying, help, help, and about 20 feet down, there was an outcropping of a tree. He caught on to that, <laughs> swinging there between heaven and earth. Help, help, somebody up there. And the voice came, yes. The voice says, praise the Lord. Who is it? Why, it's the Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me, says, I'm falling over here, and I'm about to be dashed pieces on the rocks below. Help me, Lord. Why, said my son, be glad to help you just turn loose. <laughs> Well, he wanted up. He's got to turn loose. <laughs> Just turn loose. And he, he looked up and he looked way down. And he looked back up. He looked down. He looked back up and said, Is anybody else up there? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Yes, all this great faith we boast about, but in a real emergency... Is, is there a doctor in the house? Anybody else? <laughs> oh, praise God. Oh, it's a terrifying thought to trust God. For most Christians, it is. That's why God's sending us around everywhere to get that fear out of your heart. Because the most comforting thought you can have once you shut yourself up to God is to know He can't fail. Amen. Sometimes the doctors and the psychiatrists and the seat belts and the lightning rods and everything else and the miracle drugs won't work. There are a lot of cases and trials and testings you'll have where nobody can help you. If you haven't developed a living faith in God, then you've just missed it. I mean, that's all she wrote. It's over with. Hallelujah. I was speaking in a meeting where God said to a sister, she told this testimony how he said, that your faith's no better than your confidence in my faithfulness. She said she was dying of cancer of the stomach. It was diagnosed as that. And the doctor said, if we operate, we'll have to cut most of your stomach away and we can't guarantee you we get the cancer. Well, she said, no thanks. God's healed me before. I'm going to trust him on this. And she was telling us where I was speaking and I didn't know how it was going to turn out, you know. Some of these testimonies, after you've just preached on faith, can really be a sermonette against what you just said. But it turned out good, thank the Lord. And she said, she's going to trust the Lord. She says, and I just claimed my healing. I'd done it before. And she said, in several weeks, I was getting worse, spitting up blood, said it was getting worse. And she said, I was driving along one day, Lord, why? Why is it I'm not healed? I've got faith. I believe in divine healing. You healed my broken finger instantly when I claimed it. You healed me of tuberculosis when they said I couldn't live. She says, why am I getting worse? Why am I not healed? She says, Lord, I've got faith. And she said he spoke directly to her in that car and said, daughter, it's not just a question of your faith, but of my faithfulness. Amen. Oh, I hope you get the message. Yeah. Amen. I hope you get it. Your faith is of no more effect than your confidence in his faithfulness. You can have faith in divine healing and still die of a cancer of tuberculosis. You can have faith in Psalm 91 and still lose your life because, you see, you give up your faith somewhere along the way. After six weeks, you say, well, I guess there's an exception. It isn't going to work for me. And so your faith is no more effective than how long you can hold on to his faithfulness. Do you count him faithful? Then he says, hold fast to your confession of faith because I am faithful who made you the promise. I'm not a man that can lie. If I've said it, I'll do it. All things you ask in prayer, believing you'll receive. He said all these things. Trials, yes, you're going to have them. And so just recently when my daughter Pam was going through this trial with the birth of the child, three days in labor pains, very abnormal, and just nothing happening, just the pains. And... We were standing with her, especially the last couple of days, and interceding and praying, and there was no evidence the birth was going to come forth. So that third day, she was literally exhausted, you see. 
no strength left to bear the child. It doesn't sound like a lot when you're talking about it, unless you're a woman. <laughs> but when you're there in the midst of that, just 24 hours, three days of pain, and nothing happening, no indication the baby's going to be born, you know, things get a little sticky and tense. And uh, all the devil's busy with all the thoughts, you know, the baby's dead, and, you know, just a thousand things. The third day, as I was driving over there, I was praising the Lord and thanking him and claiming his promises. And you know what he said to me through this trial? He said, my son, your faith in my promises and your confession of my promises, I've been confessing them two days. I teach it all to be able to confess them. He said, your faith in my promises and your confession of my promises is of no more effect, no more value than your faith in my faithfulness to do what I say. And I got the message because he said, all I want you to do is just say, I'm faithful. You're to the end of yourself. You're in a corner. All of you are. There's nothing else you can do. Nobody can help you. You're not going to resort to medical science. That was her decision, not mine. You see, she'd already decided, live, die, sink, or swim. I'm going to trust God this way. And so I must have said it 500 times that day, God is faithful. Every time she'd cry out or someone else would begin to intercede in the Spirit, all I would say, God's faithful. Jesus, you're faithful. They'd walk in the room where I was, I'd say, Jesus is faithful. I said, God's word's true and God's truth is word. And they just went on and on and on and ten minutes to five the next morning. It happened, you see. And all I was saying all day, God just said, your faith in my word is of no more value to you than your confidence that I'm faithful to do what I say. Oh, praise God, he's faithful. It's a comforting thought to know he is faithful. We're tempted sometimes to try some other means or give up in case of severe trials and pain and adversity and financial distress. But as long as you've got your sights on the truth that he is faithful, that holds you through. And that's been my stay time and time again. I could tell you other incidents and stories. But we so often, you know, when I say we, I mean Christians so often say that they count God faithful and they believe his word, but not really without reservation. They say they believe Matthew 6.33 or Philippians 4.19, that God will supply all of the needs according to his riches and glory. He'll supply every need they have, and yet they don't really believe that without reservation. They won't do like that engineer I talked to out in the Midwest, who said, I own a company worth a million dollars, and he says the stockholders are taken away from me. He said, praise the Lord, I couldn't care less. million dollars. Well, if I'm not careful, I'll say some of you couldn't give up a hundred dollars with that contentment, without worrying about it. He gave up a million. He said, I couldn't care less. He says, God will take care of me. He says, they voted me out of the company now said uh, they want to get rid of me so that I won't have any power at all around here. He says they've given me a year's vacation of pay just to get rid of me. He said, praise God, a whole year just to do nothing but praise the Lord and read his word. I like that brother I met from South America, a big businessman down there. He said everything I touched turned to gold and I went bankrupt and lost my mind as a result of it. I couldn't stand failure. He said in that mental institution, Jesus Christ walked in one day behind those bars Set me free, save my soul, baptize me in the Spirit. Didn't have any preacher, none of you to go testify, so Jesus did it himself. I'm glad God's God. He didn't say, do you want to be saved, do you want to be delivered, do you want the Holy Ghost? He just gave it to him. Well, he does this all the time. Oh, that doesn't take the place of the need of teaching, the preaching, the witness. That's why we're here all the time and why you go out and witness. But thank God he's still God. He does it that way. So he said, Lord, I don't want the business back. I want to serve you, but let me have it back long enough to pay off my creditors. He said, God gave me the business back. Short time, I paid all of my debts. He owed tremendous sums of money. He says, and I gave it away. Gave the business away. He said, from that point on, I've been traveling around, living out of a suitcase. You'd never know it by looking at him. He wasn't down at the heels or begging with a tin cup. He says, I've been practicing what I've heard you preach here this week on faith, that God will supply all of your needs. If you'll seek first the kingdom of God, you won't even have to take thought. He says, I don't need money. He says, whenever I have a need, he just provides it. He says that every night, 365 days a year, he supplies me with a room. I don't own a thing. He says, I've never, ever 
ask anybody or told anybody my need. They don't even know I don't have a room. But he says, every day God sends me somebody and says, God's providing you with a room. Here's the money. Go over to that motel. He says, I've never slept out on the stars yet. He said, the longest I've ever waited for God to show up was 945. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. I mean, that's what you mean, believe in Matthew 6.33 without reservation. Now, I didn't say you had to quit your job and live out of a suitcase. I'm just telling you, here are men who had more to give up than maybe most of you put together, and they just gave it up and praise God for it, and God is supplying their needs. Hallelujah. A lot of people say, I believe in divine healing, but not without reservation. They don't really believe God's faithful to heal all the time. Well, the third thing I'd like to encourage your heart to do and to believe is never to think the negative when you pray. I don't care what the circumstances are. Get your eyes off of them. Confess the positive. See your circumstances as God sees them. You know how he sees them? You know what the divine viewpoint is? Romans 8, 28. After you pray, here's what God's saying. Everything from this point on is working together for his good. Because he loves me. Now, if you begin to mutter and murmur and complain after you pray because the answer isn't on its way soon enough, say, why do I still hurt? Why do I still have the symptoms? Oh, God, when are you going to heal me? When are you going to manifest the answer to this prayer? Oh, Lord, why do I have to go through trials like this at such a time as this? That means you don't believe Romans 8, 28. You don't believe that all these things, this delay or whatever it is, is working together for your good. You see, the scriptures show there's a direct relationship between what you think and say. After you pray, what you think and say, and the answer. A direct relationship between what you think about it, what you confess about it, and your condition and your circumstances. And so since Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is it. Since Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of your tongue. You ought to watch what you think and say. You ought to guard it as carefully, your thoughts and your words, as carefully as you would guard drinking poison or standing before an onrushing locomotive. No one here would intentionally invite a doctor to inject flu germs under your skin, into your bloodstream, and yet that's exactly what you do when at the first sign of a symptom you say, I believe I'm trying to take the flu. That's what you believe. I tell people, keep on trying and you got it. <laughs> now, you wouldn't ask a doctor to put those flu germs in you, and yet you're confessing them if you're starting to confess symptoms That's right. at the first sign. Or if you get that pain down in the abdominal region, you say, oh, oh I wonder what that means. <laughs> Uncle George died of cancer, the small intestine. And mother had cancer, and there was somebody on my father's side, a second cousin or something. I'm afraid maybe it runs in the family. Well, you've just confessed it, friends. And Job said that which I feared came upon me. Or if you reply to somebody, has that money come yet you've prayed for? You said you had to have it in 48 hours. Well, I haven't seen any money yet. But if you haven't seen it by faith, you never will. I haven't seen any money yet. But I'm a hoping and a praying, but I don't know what I'm going to do if it doesn't come soon. And I think maybe I just... <laughs> think maybe I'd ever prepare a little scheme over here to see this elite Acme Finance Company just in case God fails. And then you wonder why the money doesn't come. I want to tell you, dear friends, the devil will keep you bound, sick, poor, and oppressed by snaring you in your own words. When you start confessing your circumstances, when you confess anything but Romans 8, 28, after you pray, it doesn't matter what happens after you pray, confess it's working together for my good and the answer's on the way. But when you say, I don't feel well, I better lie down to see what this means. I may be coming down with something serious. He'll snare you with that. The devil will. When you say, I know I can't go. I never get to go where I want. I don't have the money. Oh, I wouldn't try that. You say, I lack the ability. Every time I try to do anything besides this or that, I fail. How's that serious problem at home coming along? Oh, I'll tell you. If matters get any worse, I don't know what I'll do. The devil will snare you with that. You have to learn to confess not your circumstances, but what God sees when he looks at them. You see, he never sees defeat. He never thinks the negative. He never confesses doubt or fear or failure. And when you do, where you think it or say it, you nullify the effectiveness of God's word on your behalf. Now, if you want to know how important words are, Matthew 12 gives a very graphic 
description of how important what you say is. Listen to this, Matthew twelve thirty six. I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, every idle word, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Verse 37, how important are our words? For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. By your words. You see, the principle is that your circumstances, your condition, your answer to your prayer parallels what you're saying about it. They run parallel. If you're confessing, I'm hoping and praying, but I don't know, well, you see, it can never happen. You see, you're snared to the words of your mouth because death and life are in the power of your tongue and out of the abundance of your heart your mouth speaks and in your heart is where your faith is and if it's speaking the negative, contrary to the word of God, then that's really evidence of a lack of faith. Oh, so many Christians are defeating themselves with what they think and say. pastor's wife said to me after I was preaching just like the world was on fire about faith, no sooner got done the sermon, I turned to her. In effect, I said, well, how are you? Oh, she said, I think I'm trying to take my husband's cold. <laughs> well, I said, you will. <laughs> it just slips out, you know, before I can think. And it's all right for it to slip out because she needed to hear it. Oh, she said, I shouldn't have said that after a sermon like that, should I? I said, no, you should <laughs> She says, well, I'll take it back. And she did, and so she didn't take the coat. I was in another church, and I had just preached on confession. As I walked down the aisle the next night, I heard a woman talking to another. She said, where's your husband tonight? Didn't come. No, he's got his old pneumonia back. It's his. It belongs to him. He gets it every year. <laughs> People say, I don't have any faith. That's their confession. I've never seen a person without faith. Romans 12, 3, God says, I've given to every man the measure of faith. Even the people who think they don't have faith have faith in their lack of faith. They really believe they don't have faith. Now, that's faith. <laughs> they really believe they can't believe. If they would just put that faith in the unchanging word of God, you see, then that would come to pass for them. But they really believe in their rheumatism, in their pains, in their arthritis. They've got a strong faith in their sickness. They have a great expectation they'll fail if they try to do anything. They really believe they're going to die prematurely or have a wreck or lightning will strike their barn. They really believe this. A man said to me in Dayton, Ohio, I can believe for salvation. I can believe for healing. I have the faith for that. He says, I've tried and tried to get the Holy Spirit. He says, I just can't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He says, I just don't have faith for it. Now, he had the strongest faith I've ever seen in his lack of faith. He really believed he couldn't believe for the baptism. Don't you realize when you say, I can't, you can't? Don't you realize when you say you're sick, you're sick? And it isn't just words, but the fact that you've opened yourself to have that put on you which you fear. Don't you realize if you confess you'll be defeated, you'll fail? When people say they can't, they can't. I told a woman in Chicago, quit saying you can't. She said, I can't speak in tongues. I just prayed for her for the baptism. In fact, she said it very emphatically. I can't, I can't, I can't. I said, don't say you can't, you can't, you can't. Say I can, I can, I can. That was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So she said, I can, I can, I can. And she could, and she did. She was in the air. It's the power of a positive confession in the Word of God. Blessed Lord, we ask you to bring to pass, bring to pass your purpose this evening in every heart, in every mind, to cleanse it from every impurity, doubt, and fear, that hearts might reach out in faith and appropriate all that you have for your children. Father, we pray that there be no Christian who sits under this word that can do anything but believe that God is interested in their welfare. Body, mind, soul, and spirit. He wants to see his children prosper and to be in health even as their soul prospers because this is your promise. We're asking tonight for a quickening of the word upon the hearts as the spirit moves among this people here tonight. 
for the Holy Spirit, for healing, for salvation in Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, for whatever, whatever the need may be. Lord, you see the heart, you see the need, you see the doubt or fear trembling. We ask you just to take everything away that would hinder. And pray that by your grace you'll minister a willingness and peace to believe your word. In Jesus' name.